Welcome to ECE 376, lecture number one, CPU architectures and Boolean math. Now a little bit of background. Microcontrollers are a type of computer which are designed for controlling devices, such as toasters, vacuum cleaners, etc. Uh, most are built around a microcontroller with several features. Uh, for example, you have to have memory. Those are typically incorporated within the microcontroller, allowing a single chip design. You have timers. That's what differentiates microcontrollers from microprocessors. You've got timers to turn on valves at certain times, turn them off at certain times, measure time to 100 nanoseconds, etc. You've got analog inputs and outputs. They're also often added. Analog inputs allow the microprocessor microcontroller to read sensors, and analog outputs allow you to drive the speed of a motor, heat of a heater. Uh, for example, each microprocessor typically has a microcontroller. The 8080 microprocessor has the 8051 as its microcontroller. The 6800 microprocessor for Motorola is microcontroller to 6812, and so on. The chip that we're using in this class is a PIC 18F4620. Now, Microchip is a small company which specializes in microcontrollers for small startup companies. The reason we're using the PIC 18F4620 it's inexpensive, it works, it's easy to use, the tools are free. Um, I like free. With that processor, the C compiler that we're using in this course is free for you to use. The bootloaders that you need to download the code is free. The MPLAB8 is free. Um, free is nice. Some microcontrollers, the C compiler is $5,000. Uh, we're not gonna use those. The other nice thing is the PIC is easy to use. The reason we're actually using the PIC, there's actually two reasons. Uh, one, we had a senior design project a couple years ago where different groups picked different processors and their job was to set up the first two labs for ECE 376. And the one that worked was for microchip. Uh, working is nice. The other microprocessors do work, but they oftentimes have a heavy learning curve. Uh, what I want in this class is something simple that works, easy to use. That way you can focus on some of the aspects of the class, such as what is the timer, what is an interrupt, uh, what is an analog input, how you use the processor, rather than just fighting with getting the processor to work. The second reason for using the PIC is it gives you direct access to the hardware. There's other microcontrollers out there, such as the Arduino, Raspberry Pi, and so on. Those really protect you from the hardware, which is not something that we want. In this class, I want access to the hardware, which is why we're using the PIC. It's very similar to other microcontrollers. So likewise, whatever you learn on the PIC applies directly to the Motorola, Intel, um, Atmel, whatever processor you're using. And there's only so many ways to do things. Each processor has to have inputs and outputs, timers, registers, a uh, way to read analog inputs, way to output analog signals. Once you figured that out on one, it'll be very similar for the other ones. And the big reason is we have access to the registers we're not being protected from the hardware. Uh, another reason is, well, part of the reason we're using microcontrollers is they're inexpensive. The cheapest one is 45 cents. Again, it's a way to solve a problem. You don't have to use microcontrollers in electronics, for example. You can use a 555 timer and do many things without using a microprocessor. But at 45 cents a chip, if it's a useful way to do things, easy way to solve a solution, you know, why not? Also, in industry, almost everything's going towards microcontrollers. The reason is cost. If I change the hardware, I've got to redo the entire circuit board, redo the certification, uh, rewrite the code. Changing the hardware can cost billions of dollars. Changing software is free. Well, sort of. It's a whole lot cheaper just to download code. So likewise, quite a few designs are trying to focus around a microprocessor, let the processor do the work, and then the features are just basically write different codes for that one fixed piece of hardware. Now in programming, there's really three types of programming. There's low-level programming. That's what we do in this class. That's where you want direct access to the hardware and registers. I want to read the input pins, drive the output pins, set up timers, read analog inputs. Those are low-level routines. I want direct access to the hardware. That's what 376 is about. And that's why we're using a PIC. That's why we're using C compilers and assembly. We have direct control, direct access to everything. Mid-level programming are what you get in the next course, Advanced Embedded, 476, 
It's also what you see with the Raspberry Pi and Arduinos. There are somebody's already written the low level routines, and now you write calling routines. I call something to drive an output pin at 1 kilohertz. I call a routine to read the analog input. Uh, that's mid-level programming. With that, I can do things like make a quadcopter hover, um, get it to follow commands. There's also high-level programming. That's typically done in computer science. That's where you typically have things like artificial intelligence. That's routine that calls the mid-level routines that calls the low-level routines. Uh, for example, if you want to do something like get a bunch of quadcopters to swarm, do a gradient search, find the hottest spot in the room, that's more the terms of high-level programming, stuff they cover in computer science. Again, this course focuses on low-level programming. And in terms of architecture, again, almost all processes are about the same. Uh, any computer has to have five main sections. You've got to have program memory, you know, the program that tells the computer what to do. Uh, data memory, if I went up a counter, where I put the data. Stack memory, that's actually optional. If I ever use subroutines, I've got to re remember where I came from. So when I hit the return statement or end of subroutine, I know where to go back to. That's stored on the stack. Uh, registers, that's where you, you store data to be manipulated in the arithmetic logic unit. And the arithmetic logic unit, which does the addition, subtraction, stuff like that. A microcontroller has all five of these on a single chip. The good thing about that is it's easy. There's no interfacing that you have to do. The bad thing is you're stuck with what you have. There's also different types of processes termed 4-bit, 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit. That's when you do a memory read, memory write. How many bits do you get at a time? Also, when you add, subtract. How many bits do I add? The pick we're using is an 8-bit processor. It's simple. You have to start somewhere. Uh, the other processors out there, the 16-bit, 32-bits, are almost the same price, but it's a much steeper learning curve. Okay, you got to start somewhere. This is the first course many of you have seen for programming directly on the hardware. So we're going to start with something uh, fairly simple, 8-bit processor. Again, the concepts all apply. Whatever we learned here, apply to 16 bits, apply to 32 bits. But with the PIC, we're going to be able to do things like build a roulette wheel within the first two weeks. Can't say the same with some of the other processors. Now, to use the processor, you have to understand how they work. There's really two main types of memory. There's von Neumann and Harvard. Almost everything in the world uses a von Neumann architecture. That's Motorola, Intel, um, probably just about everyone else. Here the idea is that all data is the same size. If I'm an 8-bit processor, everything's 8 bits. Your data, the stack, the program, everything's the same. The nice thing about that is since everything's the same size, I can reallocate. If I need more data, I'll push this boundary up. If I need more stack, I'll push that boundary up. The bad thing about it is if I need, say, an instruction that uses more than 8 bits, a single instruction might be stored in 4 or 5 spots in memory. So knowing how much data I have doesn't really tell you how big the program can be. Another problem is you can get a stack overflow. The stack, when I start calling subroutines, it stores data on the next spot in memory, then the next, then the next. If I go too far, I'll start overwriting the program. That's called a stack overflow. You overwrite the program, and the program crashes. What the PIC does, in contrast, it uses a Harvard architecture. With a Harvard architecture, program memory, data memory, stack memory are all completely different spots in memory. What that lets me do is I get to optimize them. Program memory on our processor is 16 bits. The reason for 16 is I can store the entire instruction in 16 bits. So when I read one spot of memory, I get the whole instruction. That's nice because I've got 32K of program memory. I can actually have 32,000 lines of assembly program. The data memory is 8 bits wide, and you've got the 3968 bytes of memory. The stack is 31 deep. Now with the read-only memory, that's your program memory, what that's used for is your program, tables, vectors, main routines, subroutines, interrupt surface routines, all that. Everything has to fit inside 32K. Uh, RAM is used for your data. You've only got 4K of data, or actually 3968, something like that. Uh, that's located in between address 0 and FFFF. 
uh, let's see. This actual sp uh, split into banks. On this version of the processor, there's only one bank, so you don't have to worry about it. On future upgrades, there might be two or three banks, which causes kind of a problem with programming. If my data goes between banks, it's a little bit harder to access data within that memory. And the stack, this processor has a 31 level stack, meaning a subroutine can call a subroutine, can call a subroutine, can call a subroutine 31 times in a row. When you call a subroutine, it takes the return address, pushes it on the stack. When I hit a return statement, it pops that return address off the stack. So every call has to be matched up with a return. That makes sure that when I push data on the stack, it's pulled off. If I don't do that, the stack is messed up and all the return statements don't work anymore. The 31, what that means is if I call a subroutine, call a subroutine more than 31 times in a row, I run out of place to put the return address and the program crashes. Uh, that's part of the reason for this processor, recursion is not allowed. Um, also, I personally don't use recursion because I don't understand it, but if you did understand it, you're still not allowed to use it. Uh, another thing about this processor, there's the thing called a pipeline. It actually takes two instructions to execute each command. It takes one clock to fetch the instruction, the second clock to execute it, but there's a pipeline. So what happens on clock number two, I'm executing the instruction at address 800, but at the same time, I'm prefetching address 801. At clock three, I execute address 801, then prefetch 802. The net, net result is I'm executing one instruction every clock, unless that instruction is a go-to. If 801 is a go-to statement and I prefetched 803, well, that's the wrong command. The next command is somewhere else in memory due to the go-to. So for the pick, it's one clock per instruction plus one for every go-to statement. That makes counting clocks really easy. It's just basically every instruction is one plus one for a jump or go-to. Uh, there's also a thing called registers. Registers make it easy for the hardware. Somebody had to design the hardware and it's much easier knowing when I do an add command, what two spots of memory am I adding together rather than trying to design the hardware to add any two spots of memory. Those two specific spots of memory are called registers. Different processors have different uh, amount of registers. The 6812, for example, has six registers. The PIC only has one, the W register. That makes life nice because you have no choice. Everything goes through W. That makes life kind of annoying because if I want two registers, too bad. Uh, sometimes logic gets convoluted because I'm trying to get away with only using one register. And for Boolean math, again, a processor, everything's in binary. A couple definitions before we start. A bit is a one or a zero. That's a single flip-flop or capacitor where the, it's either five volts, logic level one, or zero volts, logic level zero. A nibble is four bits. When we get to hexadecimal, each hexadecimal number is four bits or a nibble. A byte is eight bits. A word is actually not defined. A word is more than one bit. On this processor, each line of program memory is a word. That turns out to be 16 bits. Each line of the stack is one word, 15 bits. So it's just basically a group of bits. And then binary is base two, decimal is base 10, hexadecimal is base 16. And the symbology is 0b means binary, 0x means hex, and if there's no preface, its default is decimal. In terms of base 2, base 10, and base 16, okay, base 10, 1, 2, 3, 4 means 1,000 plus 200 plus 30 plus 4. Base 2, everything goes by powers of 2. Base 16, everything's powers of 16. Uh, most important is the range of bits, a very important part. If I have a three-digit base 10 number, I can represent numbers up to 0 to 9999. That's 10 cubed minus 1. Base 2, 8 bits can go to 2 to the 8th minus 1, 255. Base 16, uh, 4 nibbles or 16 bits can go up to 65,535. That's important because if I try to store data that's out of range, what it'll do, it'll just wrap around. It'll do clock math. Hexadecimal. Uh, by the end of the semester, hopefully we'll be thinking in hexadecimal more than decimal. Um, hexadecimal is nice because I can see the bit pattern. For example, if I have a hexadecimal number F, I know the bit pattern is 1111. Hexadecimal is the same as decimal for the number 0 through 9. And somewhat arbitrarily, 
10 through 15 are just assigned A, B, C, D, E, F. Each hex decimal number corresponds to four bits. What that means is it's very easy to go between hex decimal and binary. Each nibble is four bits. It's very easy to go from binary to hex decimal. Take the binary, group it into groups of four, and each group of four is one nibble. In terms of decimal, if I want to find out what is a decimal equivalent, I have no idea. I throw that my calculator. Hex is actually a whole lot easier. I can see the bits in hex decimal. And the reason we care about the bits is the bits will be tied to I.O. pins. A 1 might be light on, 0 light off. 1 could be motor on, 0 motor off. I want to know which lights are on and which ones are off. In hex decimal binary, I can see that. In decimal, it's really hard. So we really kind of prefer hex decimal in this class. In addition, I can add numbers in base 10. I can add numbers in base 2. I can add numbers in base 16. The only catch is that when I do a carry in base 16, I'm carrying a 16. Um, or in my book, just throw it on your calculator. Calculators will solve that. The one oddity is logical operations. There's and, or, and ex exclusive or. If for logical and, if both bits are 1, the output is 1. If either one's a 0, the output's 0. I can also think of and as a bit clear. If I take A as 0, 0, anything in 0 is 0, so that's going to clear B. And with 1 is no change. The output is just B. Or, if either bit's a 1, the output is 1. Or is like a bit set. If A is a 1, then the answer is 1. If A is 0, the answer is just B. Exclusive OR is even odd. If there's an odd number of bits, the answer is 1. Even number, it's, it's 0. Exclusive OR is like a toggle. If I exclusive OR B with 0, I get B. Exclusive OR B with 1, I get not B. So exclusive OR is a bit toggle. So it's another use of AND OR NOT. AND is a bit clear. OR is a bit set. Exclusive OR is a bit toggle. And the last thing is two's complement. With the processor, I can represent both positive and negative numbers. The way negative numbers are represented is using two's complement. For example, if I look at an angle, angles are 0 to 360 degrees. If I look over here to the left, the left could either be plus 270 or minus 90. Either answer is correct. Uh, likewise on base 256, 8-bit uh, binary. If I take the number over here, that's either plus 192 or minus 64. In terms of the processor, the bit pattern is exactly the same. It's exactly the same number, just like 270 minus 90 is the same thing. How you interpret it makes a difference, though. That's why in C, you have to declare your variable signed or unsigned. If x is 192, then x is greater than 0. If x is minus 64, signed, then it's not greater than 0. So if you have an if statement, the result depends upon whether this number represents a signed or an unsigned number. As far as the process is concerned, it could care less. Both numbers behave the same because they are the same. So that's lecture number one for ECE 376 Embedded Systems. Our next lecture will look at Pick Assembler, the instructions available on this processor to do things like add, subtract, multiply, and divide.